I want to welcome you here to Dominion Church. Uh, thanks for being a part of what we're doing here uh, on Facebook. Like and share this so others can, can be blessed on YouTube. Again, like, subscribe to our channel at Dominion Church SC. And then also, uh, I hope you're listening to our podcast, the Dominion Church Podcast Experience. Um, a, a separate podcast, it's not the, the messages from Dominion, but there's a brand new podcast called The Kingdom is for Everyone. And uh, it's, it's in a month now, which is, that's, that's pretty wild. There's new episodes every Tuesday. And I would encourage you to take advantage of that as well. Um, yeah, I just had a few things on my heart today. Uh, that I wanted to share, and it's something that just kind of, a lot of times it tends to pop up uh, because I, I'll start having conversations, and, you know, the frequency of them, you're like, okay, this isn't coincidence, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like out of nowhere, someone will talk about, you know, feeling condemned or, you know, those kind of things, and then you have a couple conversations close together, and you're like, wait a second. And so it's always good to have refreshers on some of these type of issues, and who we're called to as a ministry, who I believe, I mean, I believe the body of Christ is called to be a body free from condemnation. That should manifest in every local house. And for that to happen, it has to manifest in each one of us individually, <clears throat> right? Uh, and so, uh, again, not to get into too many details, but um, one conversation in particular got to me, and it had to do with me personally, where I was told that, Sometimes when certain people are around me, they felt the way they articulated it as being condemned. And man, that just really bothered my heart because that is the last thing I want to be known for, the last thing. And so I was really pondering it. Um, man, I love this quote. I don't know who actually said this, but uh, Bishop Carlos shared this last week. I thought it was so good. He said, uh, Good men are hard on themselves. Bad men are hard on others. And, uh, and I'm not saying I'm a 100% good man. I'm just saying when I hear something like that, I go introspective. Oh, Lord, I, I don't want to be a person that when someone's around, they feel condemned. And so I was praying and, and just seeking the Lord on that because I thought, Lord, change my heart if there's something I'm doing. Because I was, had no awareness that I, I mean, especially going back to 2014. 2014 is when I had my real kind of grace revolution. And I realized, you know, I've shared this before, that I was crying out for grace. And the Lord just spoke to me and said, you want it from others, but you're not quick to give it yourself. And man, those paradigms just began to rock my world all the way back in 2014. And, uh, and so I've done my hardest to not be a person that condemns. And so I was praying about it. And then I heard this from the Holy Spirit. And this is not to, <laughs> I want to make sure I, I say this the right way. This is not to give me a free pass. But this is what the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. It said, first of all, most people don't know how to distinguish between condemnation and conviction. It's two different things. And if you carry self-condemnation, anytime you encounter conviction, it ignites that sense of self-condemnation. You hear what I'm saying? So conviction, while healthy, can be offensive if you carry self-condemnation. Because what happens is our paranoia kicks in. What? And this is actually what it got down to because I was asking the person that was sharing this. I said, have I, in your estimation, do I ever say anything condemning? Do I, do I come across? And they're like, no. It's just being around you. And then that's when I realized it's not condemnation. It's conviction. But if you carry self-condemnation, conviction sets you off. Right? And then, uh, as I was even praying more about it, this, this, I came across this. There is, there's great similarity at the onset with how we respond to either one, especially if we're wanting to hide something or especially if we're not wanting to confront something. We'll call conviction condemnation, and they're two different things, two very different things. And so I want to encourage you and those watching and listening, um, when you feel conviction. Listen to it. Be aware. What is setting you off? 
Is it self-condemnation and you're being exposed to conviction? Now, can there certainly be scenarios where you deal with condemning people? Yes, we all have. More than likely, you will again deal with condemning people. You can be around in a condemning environment. You can hear messages of condemnation. You can. And so as to be aware of it, that is not a tool that we use in the kingdom of God. Okay? You know, the Romans 8.1, that, I mean, that verse you may not know, it's Romans 8.1, but you know the verse, there is therefore now no condemnation. No means no. <laughs> no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we read that verse quickly because we're familiar with it, but there is a huge connection between condemnation and the flesh. That's where condemnation lives. Now, when I say flesh, I'm not saying pinch yourself. I'm talking about the works of the flesh. And, and you guys, what's the simplicity of the works of the flesh? Trying to do things my own way. That's, that's it. We've made it this very sinister, dark, evil thing. Oh, man, if you're led by the flesh, you know. Sometimes it can just be, I'm, I'm figuring this out on my own. I'll do this myself. That is the work of the flesh. That's what Paul is trying to have us guard against. He says the law, all it does is magnify the flesh. Um, I can't remember where I was. I guess it was Friday, Friday night. And, and it, we, the, the topic of religion came up. And I was actually, it's interesting. I, in the same conversation, I was talking to a Catholic and a Jew. And this is not a joke, okay? You know, hey, the Catholic, a Jew, and a, and a Christian walked in. No. Uh, and what I heard very quickly, almost at the same time, was, well, we try, and jokingly, but some truth, we try to figure out what we can get away with. And I turned to my friend and I said, that is religion. It tries so hard to make us behave, but what do we do? Because we're smart. Well, I'll figure out how to get right to the line. But relationship, you're not thinking about the line or the limit, right? You're not trying to think of... Um, What's the worst I can treat my friend before they'll say our friendship's over? That's not, that's not how you do it. But religion will do it that way. Um, Megan and I have been binge watching this show the last week. Uh, th this guy that goes and he, he goes into a different country, figures out how to cook their food, cooks for dignitaries at the end of each show. And in this particular place, he was in Laos and he's uh, cooking for monks and uh, he finds out he has to cook early because they cannot eat past 2 o'clock during the day. If they wait past 2 o'clock, they have to start the next day. And he was just like blown away. Why in the world won't they eat past 2 o'clock? And I said, so somewhere in their religious observation, I would imagine, now I don't want to put words in any monk's mouth in Laos, so if any monk in Laos hears this, reach out to me and let me know. But perhaps somewhere... It was agreed upon. Somewhere around midday, we just don't need to eat anymore. And it's probably going to reflect our religious uh, convictions. And then we'll start whenever we wake up the next day. Probably knowing monks, they're probably up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I have no idea. But then, can you imagine when they tell, well, what's midday? Well, noon, I mean, dude, if we stop eating at noon, you're talking 15 hours before our next meal. What about 1 o'clock? Man, that's still 14 hours. How about 2 o'clock? If we go much past 2 o'clock, <laughs> okay, 2 o'clock it is. That's what's going on in my mind. I wonder what made them land on 2 o'clock. That's how religion works. How far can I go before it's considered breaking the rules? Relationships don't do that. So, conviction and condemnation, two very different things. The word condemn means to express strong disapproval of, to demonstrate guilt, to judge or pronounce unfit for use. Condemnation has no redemptive quality. No redemptive quality. It'd be like someone saying, hey, I want to make a confession to you. You know, I, whatever, whatever they did, whatever bad thing they did, I, I, 
I stole a candy bar from the you know, gas station, whatever. Shouldn't do that. But if your response is, I knew you were a thief, you no good sack. Well, that, that is a spirit that condemns. No, all I'm doing is confirming your guilt, con- confirming your wrong, uh, letting you know I disapprove of you and your actions. Conviction would be, hey, you're better than that. That's not who you are, right? You're, you're a son. You're a daughter of a good father that always provides. You need a candy bar. You come talk to me. I'll buy you a candy bar. Do you see the difference? It's not just a shift in tone. It's a shift in perspective. It's a shift in, I want you to wallow in your offense, or I'm here to give you a shift in perspective and come up out of that thing. And, and, um, you know, Romans 6, 14, sin has no dominion over you since you're not under law, but you're under grace. So there's that connection between grace and conviction. Now, there's no grace with condemnation, but grace and conviction. Because let's be honest, the fear of the law does not give us victory over sin. If it did, then we'd probably all be good right now. Because most of us are pretty afraid of the consequences of the law, or at least we have been in times past. Now, in the days these are being written, much of the culture was harshly directed by the requirements and demands of the law. I mean, so much so, the Pharisees would use it against Jesus. That's, I don't know how much more hardcore you get than that. Typically, and it seemed like Jesus' favorite law to break, and it's just something to think about and ponder, was the Sabbath. He loved breaking that law. I mean, but again, think about it. Does the fear of the law, thou shalt not steal, stop people every day from taking stuff that's not theirs? No. It's not going to stop you. It's not going to stop you. For many, even the fear of the consequences of breaking the law isn't enough to stop them from doing it. What do I mean? Prison, community service, loss of property, loss of family. Some laws you break, loss of life. And if you know, it's still not enough to stop us. It's not. So if the fear of the law doesn't bring us the power to overcome sin, then what does? It is grace. And grace and conviction go together. Grace is free from condemnation. John 8, 10, and 11. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn you. Now go. Sin no more. That sin no more is added to the King James translation in the actual Greek, it's not even, that phrase isn't even there, which is, again, amazing to ponder. Could it be that Jesus could literally tell someone, I don't condemn, and then go on your way? I, I feel like some of the scholars looked at that and thought, well, there's, that can't be the end of the story. How about this? And sin no more. It, it, Jesus wasn't focused on sin. He was focused on restoring her. That's what he was focused on. And so, again, staying along this, this thought of condemnation. Condemnation typically, how it manifests in our lives personally, it comes from a place of our own insecurities, our own religious expectations. It doesn't have to even be religious. Let's just say our own expectations of how someone should behave and what someone should or should not do. And when we find them lacking according to our own standard, we condemn. The last few weeks in particular, I've been been doing a lot of study on Judas, (laughs) Peter, Saul, who we know more by Paul. And it's funny, you... Judas in particular, I don't, I don't know what's going on with me. I'm, I'm going to have to, y'all pray for me. I got to keep going with it. But man, I'm really getting this heart of compassion for Judas. I really am. Because he was a disciple of Jesus. You cannot tell me for three and a half years 
that he just lived with Jesus, and in his heart the whole time he was thinking, I'm going to betray him, and, and, and I want to see him killed. He was named after the tribe Jesus came from. His parents were so proud to name him Judas because they were hopeful he would see the Messiah. I mean, we, we so focus on the offense, and it was great. But if we're not careful, we'll condemn Judas, even though Jesus wouldn't condemn him. We'll condemn him. Why? Because, again, we have our own standard, our own expectation. And can I tell you this? Let me just make my own confession. I have thought of Judas a lot through the years, right? I mean, that's kind of one of the first kind of people you run into, even when you're, I guess, Sunday school even. You, you know, you got your Moses, and you got your David and Goliath, and Noah's Ark, and you get into the ministry of Jesus. But there was this one guy, Judas, Right? And I would think, when I was Gabriel's age, Eliana's age, I would think, well, I would never do that. Never. I want to challenge you, if you're watching, listening, <laughs> saying something just like that is the birthplace of condemnation. It's the birthplace of it. I'd never do that. Really? Really? Because I promise you, Judas probably thought he'd never do it either. Or Peter. Man, I'd hear Peter. I bet how could he deny Jesus three times to his face? I would never do that. That's a spirit of condemnation. On, let's be honest. We probably would have done it more than three times, and we probably would have done it quicker. <laughs> no, no, that's not me. I'll repent later. No, I don't know that guy. Uh -uh. <laughs> Because I'm pretty sure Peter never thought that he would betray Jesus. Actually, I'm, I would say Peter would have fought you if you even suggested he would betray Jesus. I mean, in the Last Supper, he's telling Jesus, there's no way. I, I'm not going to let anyone touch you. I'm not going to let anyone harm you. Even there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's the one that takes up the sword. No one's going to touch him. And man, before 24 hours can pass. But here we are, man, we're just convinced there's no way. And if we're not careful, that is the spirit of condemnation in its infancy. So, modern day, you know, you got friends, you know, treating people like garbage. Oh, I'd never do something like that, knowing that you've done it before. We got people wrestling their marriages. We got divorce going on. We've got all, man, I would never do that. Hold, just hold on a second. Now, I, I pray that it never happens to you, but your heart, why is that the response of our heart in the moment? Instead of what can we do to help? What can I do? Because I know you're in pain. What can I do to ease your suffering? Instead of in our minds, well, God bless, Lord, you help them. I'm, I'm not doing that stuff. We've got to be careful what is coming up, welling up from our hearts. Because condemnation at its core is always an unfair and abusive tactic. It's basically like you see someone in a fight, they get hit down to the ground, and you come up and give them the kick in the gut. That's, that's about as accurate a picture as I can think. So not only do we encounter someone who feels ashamed because of what they've done, but then we throw condemnation on top of it to magnify the guilt, to magnify the smallness that they're already wrestling with. And, and I can hear the thoughts of justification even in my own mind now. If they feel bad enough about this mistake now, then, then they won't do it again. You ever thought that? I mean, we thought that as parents. I'll make them really feel bad about this, and maybe they won't do it again. And as loving parents, we're actually trying to use condemnation. And the problem is condemnation doesn't change a heart. It might change behavior temporarily, but it won't change the heart. It might give enough fear in a moment to make them think twice before they do it again. But it's not going to change the heart. If they feel enough pressure and guilt now, Maybe they'll be serious enough to never do this again. 
So the question I have, is this the best that we've got? Is that the best that we have? Do we honestly think that our position in life is, like the Pharisees, to become accusers of those who have fallen and failed? This way will never bring healing to someone's heart, and it will never help them gain victory over sin. Back to Judas before I wrap up. I'm actually, there, there's a message I'm going to minister here when it's the right time. <laughs> um, I don't know the title of it yet. It's either going to be called The Table or The Table of Your Enemies. And, and going back to Judas, um, there in the Last Supper, we focus on, and I understand, we focus on the bread and the wine because that's where we get our modern observation for communion. But don't forget that this communion was being offered during Passover. Passover is not just bread and wine. It's, it's a feast. It, I mean, it's, you've got lamb. You, I mean, it's, it's dating back to Exodus. The first Passover. The first Passover, you guys remember? When, when Israel was going to be freed from Egypt, and they all took lambs into their house... That, that is what they're celebrating in the time of the Last Supper. They're celebrating Passover. So they're feasting, and they're in a place of joy. They're in a place of, commemoration, uh, of, of, of commemorating the move of God and God's rescue of, of Israel from slavery into freedom. So there's a lot going on. And the, the Jewish word for that is Seder, the Seder meal, Passover, and, uh, and one of the things that just blew me away going back to being free from condemnation, I think it's interesting, first of all, not only did Judas have a seat at the table, and at this point, at this point, the offense in his heart had already been growing. It started growing, I believe, uh, at, at Simon, the Pharisee's house, when Jesus went there to eat. And that's where the woman came with the alabaster box, broke it on the feet of Jesus. Uh, because just a couple verses after that, it said Judas began to, to think, talk in his heart about the extravagant waste of, of what had happened. And then it just says he decided in his heart that he was going to seek payment for it. Basically, that's my paraphrase. So something, that was a highly offensive environment. I don't want to get too deep into it, uh, but I was having this discussion the other day. Have you ever thought about how that woman just walked in with such freedom into that Pharisee's house? Because her reputation, I, I, got, I know we got kids in here, and her reputation was, you know, prostitute. Why did she have such liberty to walk into that Pharisee's house? Maybe it's because she'd been there before. I'm, uh, anyway, just walk on in. And, and could it be that part of the Pharisee's offense, in addition to her, of course, washing the feet of Jesus with her hair and, and all that, maybe he also could have been like, hey, you, anyway. Usually when you come to my house, I'm, I'm paying. You're all okay right now. Anyway. That's that religious spirit. It's, <laughs> oh, man. And, and, and it, could it be? He's like, why aren't you condemning her? Because that is not what Jesus does. And then we go on to find that what she did served as preparation for him. Man, so good. Anyway, I lost my train of thought. So <laughs> not only did Judas have a seat at the table, he was in close proximity to Jesus. Close, I, I think they were sitting side by side. We don't know exactly how big the table was. If you're Da Vinci, it was a table for 24, but we're only going to sit on one side. Right? That's, you guys know what I'm talking about, the Last Supper, Da Vinci's famous painting. All 12 guys are on one side of the table. I'd be like, uh, guys, come on, give me a break. So they were in close proximity. Judas was likely sitting right beside him. He said, whoever dips with me is going to betray me. <laughs> I don't know if Judas wasn't listening or if, again, there was, such, there was such a love, connection, and trust with the disciples and Jesus. He already knew he was going to do it anyway, and he knew, well, I mean, I don't know. 
And so he dips. This is what blew me away. In Seder tradition, when you dip, <laughs> the King James says dip the sop, which that's not a phrase we really use around here, which basically means you take unleavened bread, you dip it in most likely what was fish sauce. So that sounds pretty appetizing, right? And, and, and that's what you do. But, but this is what blew me away. Once, he, once you dip the sop, you hand the bread to somebody that you love. And so I believe they dipped and Jesus handed it right to them. You are going to betray me. You are going to sell me out. You're going to be a catalyst for my crucifixion. But you know what? Here, I love you. That's, does it change what I, what I want for you and what I think about you? I still love you. And so Judas responded to two things. He responded to the overwhelming conviction of Jesus. Can you imagine? It's probably one of the greatest tsunamis of conviction you can imagine. He knows Jesus is innocent. He knows he's the Messiah, yet he sells him out anyway. And then his own self-condemnation. It was self-condemnation that drove him to crucify himself. So think about it. The law cannot bring you victory over sin. It just magnifies it. Only conviction that's attached to grace can bring you freedom over sin. So how do we know that Judas was dealing with self-condemnation? Because he hung himself. That's about the only way out. It's the only way out. And, uh, and so I, I just... Um, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll stop there. Um, we've got, we have got to, I always got to point this, we have to take condemnation off of our utility belt. If you've got a pouch that you like to keep some of that in there, we got to take it out. We got to take it out when it comes to ministry. We got to take it out. Well, we just need to take it out regardless. But it's very subtle as parents. If we're not careful, we'll dip into that condemnation pouch. Um, we'll dip into it with people that don't look like us, that don't sound like us, that don't think like us. Um, and why in the world would we think it's an effective strategy to use against those that don't even have a relationship with Jesus? All it does is turn them off. Because Jesus doesn't condemn. So, you can say you're loving Jesus and you're condemning. They're like, well, listen, I, I don't know. Jesus sounds great, but you're crazy. And so conversation over. I'm reminded often, sometimes it plays in my mind on repeat, is, uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, he said, I, I love your Jesus, but I, 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 don't, I don't love his followers. That. That's conviction right there, right? That's conviction. And so, Lord, just help us, help us, help us take, take condemnation off the table. And the truth is even conviction. I and you and I, you and I can't be active components of conviction. Conviction is the work of Holy Spirit. Right? That's what, that's what it says in John. Jesus said, I'm going to send a helper to you. When he comes, he's going to convict. So, so you don't even get to convict. But we carry conviction. See, that, that's where we had this conflict going on. I carry Holy Spirit. I, I can't help that. And so when you encounter Holy Spirit and you start being convicted, that's where we need to operate in discernment. When you recognize someone's walking in conviction, what do we do? You just turn that love on higher. Listen, I, I, this, I, don't, I, I, I'm, I don't know why you're feeling this way. I just want you to know that you're loved. I just want you to know that, that, that God is not against you. He's for you. I just want you to know uh, you can't run from his goodness. You can't run from his embrace. Listen, it is the character and nature of God to seek and to save that which is lost. And so, Lord, just help us. Help us to flow in this. This is, this is a reflection of the heart and nature of God, and we got to get it right. I mean, we just do.
So Lord, help us to take condemnation out of, off of our tool belt. Help us to, to demonstrate your character and nature, to demonstrate your love that doesn't know boundaries. Lord, to, to truly love people into that encounter. And then let, so conviction, that's, that's all on Holy Spirit. That's all on Holy Spirit. What's our role? Our role is to love. Our role is to encourage. Our role is to show and demonstrate the character and nature of God. And then Holy Spirit does his thing. I just say it this way. Holy Spirit's the sheriff of the kingdom. He's the only sheriff. Him and him alone. He convicts. I don't know how to convict, but he does. And so, Lord, just help us to be at rest in that, to trust you in that. Lord, I just pray all these things now in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So just, just give you some things to think about. Uh, th- this is, this is uh, something we got to get right. And uh, just want to encourage you in that. So, so again, please like and share this and, and help us get this out to, to, to be in front of more people, whether it be Facebook or YouTube or, or uh, our podcast. Um, before we finish out, we normally don't actually do this uh, on our online stuff, but uh, I, I would just invite you, uh, if you'd like, to, to be a, a financial support to what we're doing here at Dominion. Uh, we would certainly appreciate that. We do have some stuff we can pull up on the screen. I don't know if, uh, is Judah back there? By any chance? Uh, do, you see, do you see that slide, the, the giving slide there? If you'll click on that, that'll help us out. We got somebody back there in training on the fly there. If you just click on it, you see there on the, on the yeah. Uh, and so uh, you, you can actually text to give, and you just text your amount to 854-888-6590. And uh, that's the easiest way to give. And um, yeah, we, we really would appreciate it. There's also a, a giving link on the description of our videos on Facebook and YouTube and all those things. So uh, you can take advantage of that. And uh, we really would appreciate it. All right, well, God bless you. Um, do what? I will. Well, I'll go ahead and dismiss the video here. And then we're, we're gonna do some, some things on the other side. But again, please come be a part of one of our gatherings. Right now we're meeting at one o'clock p.m. on Sundays at the historic Taylor Mill. We'd love for you to come be a part of what we're doing here in person so we can love on you and minister to you. It would be our privilege. All right, God bless you. Have an amazing week. Uh, Have a wonderful Labor Day, and we will see you next time. Bless you.